This is PowerPoint Lecture 2.6 on American Involvement in World War II. We want to start off with, rather, if you'll recall from the discussion of World War I, I mentioned that one of the things we notice uh, in conflicts is a polarization. Uh, we saw it in World War I with the Central Powers uh, and the Allies. We'll see it again here with the Axis and Allies. Uh, the polarization really begins uh, at the end of the 1920s and early 1930s, particularly with the Pact of Steel between the two fascist powers, uh, Italy and Germany. When we want to talk about the roots of the Second World War, we really have to start with the First World War. There's two things I want to, I want to mention here in terms of this. The first, if you recall from our discussion of, of World War II, or World War I, rather, uh, you'll remember that prior to the U.S. invasion or intervention in 1917, uh, you had basically a stalemate. It was a stalemate that had lasted for the better part of three years, uh, and neither side was particularly able to make any headway against the other. Uh, we had the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which knocked Russia out of the war, allowing the Germans to redeploy uh, a large portion of their resources to the Western Front, uh, and that tied it up into a stalemate. Well, when the U.S. intervenes with all of its resources and all of its abilities, all of its manpower, uh, this tilts the side, and so the Germans, they don't actually lose the First World War. There's an armistice agreed to, as we discussed uh, in the in the PowerPoint on World War I, but had it not been for that U.S. intervention, uh, the negotiated settlement at Versailles may have been very different. Uh, we then have also as the roots uh, the Treaty of Versailles itself, which we went over in some detail during that lecture, uh, and the German reaction to that, which was one of the reasons for the rise of the National Socialist Party, the Nazis. Between the two wars is really the time when you have U.S. isolationism, the conservative governments that took over in the 20s weren't particularly concerned with American foreign policy, uh, and so they paid little attention to what was developing both in Asia and in Europe. You have the Neutrality Acts that come up. One of the conclusions that was drawn from the First World War is that one of the things that drew the United States into the war was their support for Great Britain. The Neutrality Acts between 35 and 37, of which there are a slew, uh, will basically dictate that the United States will not support anyone that is a belligerent uh, in European conflicts. This as an attempt to prevent the United States from being drawn into the war. This idea will be scrapped in 1939 uh, when the Roosevelt administration begins to side with uh, Great Britain. In addition to this, we also have we, we discussed in the last PowerPoint at some length uh, the discussion of the two new deals that were used to alleviate the Great Depression. What we saw was that neither of these worked particularly well. Uh, the first new deal we saw a temporary recovery, though production levels didn't go to their pre-1929 levels. Then the economy slunk back into a recession, and the second new deal was launched with unemployment insurance, etc., the creation really of the welfare state. This, too, didn't have the effect that Roosevelt was hoping. It had some effect, but not nearly a significant enough effect to pull the economy uh, back into a robust growth. Um, and so, prior to the onset of the Second World War, the, the American economy is still suffering through the Depression with really no significant hope in sight that it will it will come back. Uh, now, in addition to this, just as a kind of a brief lesson in Hegelianism, uh, this comes to us from uh, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel's philosophy of right. Uh, we have the philosophical basis of corporate fascism. The basic idea, without getting into we could teach an entire course on this, but without uh, getting into it in any great length, Hegel's idea is the dialectic, okay? The principal dialectic of interest to us is the dialectic between the infinite and the finite. Uh, for Hegel, in the political realm, the infinite is represented by the state. Uh, 
As a way of understanding this, just think of this. Individual human beings come and go. They rise and fall. They die. Okay, uh, the state endures. The United States, for example, is now some what was seventeen seven eighty nine, really, with the Constitution. So we're two hundred and thirty years into it, uh, roughly. Uh, people have come and go. We're now on our fifth generation of Americans, uh, and so the finite are individual human beings that come and go. The corporate state itself, the abstraction of the state, uh, endures and is therefore uh, closer to the infinite. Uh, because of this, at least partially because of this, um, for Hegel, the individual, the finite, is only comprehensible insofar as it participates in the whole. This serves as the basis of what becomes known as state socialism, or as what becomes known as organic fascism which is the National so Socialist System and Mussolini's fascist party in Italy, uh, where the state itself is the corporation, okay, on an, in an economic sense. They own all means of production. Uh, and all individuals owe their existence to the state. They are only significant insofar as they participate in the state. Um, and so this creates a kind of juggernaut of the state. It turns the state into a living entity, okay? As I mentioned before, in the interwar years, we had American neutrality, the German reaction to the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, when Now, the, now uh, just a, a, a brief aside on the rise of the National Socialists. We have the Munich Putsch in 1923, which is an unsuccessful attempt by the Nazi party to seize power. Hitler will serve time in jail for this, uh, and where he'll write Mein Kampf. After that, he takes a more pragmatic uh, and patient approach to it, and assembles to himself uh, a, a large number of political allies. These are easy to assemble because during the 1920s, conditions in Germany became degeneratively worse. By, 19, by the time of the Munich Putsch, actually, it was uh, the, the, the exchange value between the German mark and the U.S. dollar was one and a half billion marks to a dollar. Because to meet their reparations payments, the Germans just printed money. And so it became very valueless. There was nothing to back it. Uh, and so... To use the Treaty of Versailles uh, as a rallying cry and the deplorable economic conditions that were imposed principally by the French as a rallying cry gained a lot of support for the National Socialists. And in point of fact, in the Reichstag elections, this is during the period of the Weimar Republic, the end of the Weimar Republic, in fact, in the Reichstag elections of 1932, uh, the, the Nazis win a plurality of the votes. They win 33% of the votes. Uh, as a result of that, um, Hindenburg, von Hindenburg, who is the president of the Weimar Republic, is compelled constitutionally to allow Hitler to attempt to form a government, which he will do. Uh, and he gains certain concessions out of H von Hindenburg uh, and ultimately will become chancellor of Germany after which uh, the Germans, through a series of events, among them the Reichstag fire, will proclaim emergency powers for Hitler and begin to call him the Fuhrer. And at that point, the last vestiges of the Reichstag will be swept away. This is by 34, uh, and we'll have the, the onset of the Nazis. Um, and in fact, in the 1934 uh, Nazi Party rally, there's a... a a movie of it called uh, Triumph of the Will, uh, and the direction of it is actually unbelievable. It, it really highlights the mysticism of the Nazi party. Um, now, immediately upon entering, Hitler begins to test the ally resolve, particularly Great Britain and France, in terms of the enforcement of the conditions of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the first thing they'll do is, as a result of the inability to pay reparations, the French had occupied the Roar River Valley, which was the coal area, if you'll recall, from the previous discussion, the discussion of, of World War I, I think we mentioned this. Uh, well, the French will withdraw 
the Germans then refuse to make reparations payments, and Hitler will move the Wehrmacht in to occupy the Ruhr River Valley and prevent the French from doing it. This is the first test of French resolve, and the French fail to respond to it. Okay, Because what we have to understand here is, yes, after the First World War, as a result of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was stripped of its armed forces. Okay, It had little more than a police force. But France and Great Britain also demobilized to an extraordinarily low level. Okay, Between the French and the Germans, each of them had about three operational divisions. So they really weren't in a condition or a position at this point. This is now 1934. They weren't in a position to do anything about this. Germany will take this as a sign, and Hitler will begin to rearm. Okay, he'll begin to build a U-boat fleet. He'll begin to build a Luftwaffe, which was prohibited by the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, in Munich in 1936, he'll make his uh, he'll uh, make his announcements uh, as to Germans' foreign policy intentions and uh, recreating a, a more powerful state. In the same year, they will occupy uh, the Sudetenland uh, and. Uh, negotiate with Great Britain uh, uh, under uh, Lloyd George at this point and Clemenceau uh, in France uh, and they will come back with the idea that we now have peace in our times. This is the famous peace in our times uh, speech in which they believe by by uh, offering a conciliatory position to Hitler and allowing the Germans to reoccupy German-speaking territories in Czechoslovakia uh, this will solve the problem. This is, of course, almost immediately demonstrated to be fallacious with the Anschluss with Austria. Germany, uh, through intimidation more than anything else, will pull Austria into a unified state. Uh, okay. Now, while all this is going on in Europe, we also have Japan. Now, we talked about this, actually, from the very beginning of this epic. In the beginning of this epic, uh, we talked about two things that were simultaneously happening. We had the United States attempting to expand its ability to project force into Asia uh, with the open-door policy and the assembly of the islands as refueling stations. Well, at the same time, we have the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, which establishes Japan as a world power. Uh, and as a power in Asia. Uh, and so we have these two expanding empires in a collision course with each other. I mean, in point of fact, war is inevitable between them. What we have in Japan rising from the late 19th century, this is particularly true after the Sino-Japanese War, and especially after the Russo-Japanese War, we have an alliance formed in Japanese politics between the rising military-industrial complex uh, and the old aristocracy. Okay, so we have the militarists and the, the old aristocracy being the old, you know, from the, the old uh, 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 samurai warriors, basically. Uh, you know, the old holdovers from the samurai. So we have the militarists and the industrialists forming an alliance. As a result of this, the Japanese emperor himself will become kind of a factotum. The Japanese emperor becomes largely a puppet ruler. Okay? Uh, and Tojo will become prime minister, and he is the combination of the militarists and the industrialists. Japan will at this point take a much more aggressive foreign policy. Now, they will take advantage of the political developments in China, just briefly to run through them, at, 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 at no great length, just briefly to run through them. <coughs> in the early 20th century, we still have the Japanese emperor. But the Europeans withdraw. We talked a little bit under the development of the American Empire about the Boxers' Rebellion and things like that. Well, we have the, the, the collapse of the European position in China and the rise of the national, nationalist government under a guy by the name of Sun Yat-sen. Okay, this is the formation of the Kuomintang Party. Okay, well, they will get rid of the empire. They'll get rid of the emperor. Okay, he'll, he'll be forced to abdicate. 
When he abdicates, he goes into exile in Manchuria and sends a missive, okay, a plea to the Japanese emperor. The, the emperor of China at this point is a teenager, okay? Well, the emperor of Japan is, is a teenager as well, so they have a lot in common. They're both emperors, uh, 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 and so he calls upon uh, the Japanese emperor to render him assistance to retake his throne. The Japanese emperor is, of course, more than willing to do this, uh, and it is used by the militarists in Japan as an opportunity to occupy Manchuria. The idea being that the Japanese industrial complex is continually is continuing a rapid growth. They need to be able to continue this rapid growth uh, of a regular steady supply of raw materials, particularly because they're now on, on the tangent to attempt to conquer all of Asia. Okay, so they need this raw material base. Well, Manchuria is a perfect base of operations. And so when the Chinese emperor invites them in, this is one of the things that's not usually talked about in history. Okay, but you Google it. You can look it up. The Japanese, in point of fact, didn't invade Manchuria. They were invited into Manchuria. They weren't invited in by the nationalist government. That's why they say it was an invasion. They were invited in by the emperor of China, who was at the time in Manchuria. The Japanese occupy Manchuria then. Very rapidly, the emperor of China realizes that his, his objective is not going to be seen. The, the Japanese have no interest whatsoever in Chinese internal politics. Okay? Uh, the Japanese, therefore, will occupy Manchuria, and, in 19, and this is in 1932. Okay? As a result of the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, this will be kind of one of the many tests of the League of Nations. We talked about the League of Nations. This is one of the many tests of the League of Nations in which the League will fail. We have, in the 1920s, we have Mussolini's first invasion of Ethiopia, where Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, goes, or in the 1930s, rather, where Haile Selassie goes to uh, uh, the League of Nations and appeals for assistance to stop the uh, invasion of Ethiopia by Italy. Uh, and the League of Nations will do nothing. The League of Nations needs a unanimous decision to be able to to act, and so because no no unanimous decision is there, they don't act, and Ethiopia is left to the tender mercies of Mussolini, who rapidly, uh, in the second invasion, uh, as it works out, takes Ethiopia. Well, we have a similar situation here. The nationalist government in China comes to the League of Nations uh, asking for assistance against to boot the Japanese out of Manchuria. The League of Nations does nothing. The Japanese are so incensed by the League's objection to this that they'll actually storm out of the meeting and never go to the League of Nations again. And it's about that time that the League of Nations itself becomes a factotum. It becomes a meaningless organization. Uh, in 1937, the, ja the Japanese will use the provocation of the nationalist government to invade China properly, and they'll 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 to invade China proper, and they'll they'll rapidly spread down the coast of China. Switching back to the European theater of operations. Uh, Things really get going now. Now, at this point, at this point, we what have what, what have we looked at? We've seen, we've seen the, uh, and this is not this is not in any way meant to be. We're we're just we're just introducing some of this. Our our focus is going to be on American involvement, but we want to get a little background of the war. If you want to look at uh, the Second World War in more detail, uh, you might do well to take Professor Donaldson's course on World War II. He's the one that traditionally uh, teaches it. Uh, it's, a course, it's a full semester course on the Second World War. Um, it's obvious now that Europe is going to experience war. Hitler, for his part of view, does not want to face what the Kaiser did in World War I, which was a two-front war. He wants to be able to devote all German resources. The plan is a very simple one. Okay, one of the things that's true in the Second World War is that offensive tactics and offensive technology have now moved to the point where they actually outstrip defensive technology. If you remember in our discussion of World War I, one of the problems, one of the reasons for the degeneration into a stalemate and the failure of the von Schlieffen plan was that defensive technology and defensive tactics were superior to offensive technology and tactics. 
weapons. That's not the case in the Second World War. By now we have air power, we have armor, okay, so we have offensive capabilities. The German plan is a simple one. First, not using von Schlieffen's plan, as it works out, sidestep the Maginot Line, run through the Low Countries, crush France, then knock out Great Britain. In the meantime, while this is going on, and one of the things I don't really mention here, in 1935, Spain uh, erupts in a civil war with a fascist government under Franco challenging the Republican government. Uh, and the Germans will side with Franco, and it will be the first practical use, among other things, the first practical use of the Luftwaffe. The, German will, the Germans will send the Luftwaffe down uh, to bomb Spanish cities uh, in support of Franco's offensive to take over the government, which he will successfully do. Franco will lead Spain then until the early 70s. Um, he'll actually survive the Second World War. Okay, knock France out, then you can turn your attention to Russia. The real enemy is Russia. Hitler's idea is Lebensraum, to effectively establish German colonies in what was then the Soviet Union, what is Russia, okay? Well, in order to be able to devote all of the resources to knocking out France and Great Britain, they need a secure eastern border. They can't be concerned with, with uh, uh, a second front in Russia. And so Hitler will outmaneuver uh, the Allies, principally Churchill. He'll outmaneuver Churchill diplomatically, because Churchill and 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 the French will also be trying to court the Soviet Union into an alliance to neutralize Germany. The problem is that they send foreign ministers over who negotiate with with uh, with uh, Stalin. And then they have to come back and discuss it with their various prime ministers, uh, and this delays any eventual deal, okay? And they won't give in to Stalin's demands. What Stalin wants is half of Poland, okay? Which, in his defense, is, is the very eastern part of it anyways, is Russian-speaking, okay? Hitler will shift tactics. Hitler will actually assign his foreign minister von Ribbentrop and give him carte blanche. He simply tells von Ribbentrop, you go over there. I don't care what deal you cut. You talk to that madman Stalin. Because Hitler and Stalin hated each other. There was no love loss here. This was not an alliance. A lot of, a lot of times this is thought of as an alliance. This was not an alliance. This was a very begrudging non-aggression pact. Hitler's ultimate objective in the Second World War isn't Britain and France. It's Stalin. He wants the Soviet Union. Okay? Britain and France have to be knocked out in order for him to transfer German resources over to be able to invade the Soviet Union. Okay? So he sends von Ribbentrop, he says, I don't care what deal you make. You make whatever deal you have to, but you make sure that we get a non-aggression pact because I don't want to have to have a, a two-front war. I want to be able to knock Britain and France out. Then I can shift everything over and kick the living hell out of Stalin. Okay? So I don't care what deal you make. Von Ribbentrop goes over and comes back with a deal. This is in late August of 1939. Comes back with a deal with Stalin. Okay? In exchange for Soviet neutrality in the war, Hitler and and uh, the the Germans and Russians will divide Poland in half. And in fact, Stalin, Russia, the Soviet Union rather, gets more than half of Poland. They get more than Germany does. Okay? Uh, and in point of fact, when Germany invades Poland from the east, Russia occupies Poland from the west, or from the east, rather. When Germany invades Poland from the west, Russia occupies Poland from the, from, from the east. Okay, so they divide Poland between them. Uh, this frees Hitler up to launch the Blitzkrieg, which you see there. Poland taken in September of 39, Norway, April and May of 40, that's to... to uh, prevent any attempt by the by Britain and France to uh, launch a second invasion on Germany from the north. Uh, France, Belgium, Holland, May and June of 1940, the Balkans in April and May of 1941. The Battle of Britain, uh, I don't know why I say summer, yeah, summer fall of 1940, okay? Uh, and so all of that goes on. That's the main thrust of the German offensive, and I'm not going to talk about it a lot. I mean, my goodness, so many textbooks, so many classes, so many... Okay, that's the main thrust of it. But remember and keep in mind that Hitler's objective here, okay, 
is to, to, be, to, to neutralize all this territory so that he can free up resources to go and kick the hell out of the Soviet Union. That's his real adversary. Okay? The problem is that he fails. All of it's very successful. All of it is very well done, except for the Battle of Britain. Okay? He fails to bring Britain to its knees and fails to launch an offensive into Britain. As a result, Britain is still around. Now, during this period, Britain will stand alone against the Nazis. Okay? Supported, okay, uh, at least with material and equipment, by the United States. But nonetheless, Britain stands alone. Okay? Well, Hitler decides that he can no longer delay the war with the, the inevitable war with the Soviet Union. And so he will launch Operation Barbarossa in June of 1941. He launches it actually the same day that Napoleon had launched his invasion of Russia. Uh, and originally, and I'm not going to get into the details of it, originally things go well, but gradually the German offensive grounds to a halt um, because of lack of resources uh, and a dramatic underestimation on Hitler's part of the Soviet Union's capacities. Okay? The American reaction to all of this. The final of the Neutrality Acts is passed in 1939, and it lifts the arms embargo to the belligerents. This is essentially paves the way and frees the United States to uh, send equipment to Great Britain. Then we have the Destroyer Deal and Lend-Lease Program. Okay, they give 50 destroyers to Great Britain. The problem is this, in the early stages of the war especially. I used to play a game. One of the games I, I, I used to absolutely love to play was a game called Silent Hunter 2, where you were a German U-boat commander. You could command the destroyers if you wanted to, but who wants to command a destroyer? And it's more fun to command a U-boat. Uh, and so you were a U-boat commander. And in the early phases of the war, really prior to 1942, the U-boats dominated the sea. There just simply wasn't enough of them, but they dominated the sea. Okay? Uh, and so in an effort to, to protect American shipping and British shipping as it crossed the Atlantic from the United States uh, with war material, uh, they created... And it actually took them better than two years to create it, because the British didn't have enough naval power to run a convoy system that would escort merchant ships all the way across the Atlantic. The Americans will give them 50 destroyers, okay, in exchange for bases in the Western hemis Hemisphere. Uh, and they'll issue loans to Britain. Um, 50 destroyers in exchange for British bases in the Western Hemisphere. This is the British islands of the Lesser Antilles, which were at this point turned over to the United States. Uh, issued loans to Great Britain to lease additional destroyers to protect shipping. The Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies uh, becomes a lobbying group to lobby the United States for entrance into the war. And, and America First Committee, very similar to that. Um, what we have to remember is when we have now the Atlantic Charter in the summer of 1941, uh, which is a plan for the execution of the war and the planning for its aftermath. This is where it's decided that, okay, America is obviously now going to enter the war. The first thing we're going to do is knock out Germany. Then we'll deal with knocking out Japan. Now, what we have to understand is at this point in time, overwhelmingly, Okay, about 80%, 80 to 85% of the American people opposed U.S. entry into the war. They saw this very much like the First World War, that this was a European affair. But for very similar reasons to Wilson, Roosevelt will seek entrance into the war in favor of the Allies. Okay, uh, principally because you have a sluggish economy, these are democratic powers fighting the dictatorships of Germany and Italy. Uh, and so there is a, a, a very similar parallel to what Wilson goes through uh, that Roosevelt will now go through. Okay, that was the preliminary phases in Europe. Really, really uh, prior to U.S. involvement. Now we'll see the early phases in Asia. We have, as I mentioned, in 37, 
the Japanese invasion of China, and the very famous rape of Nanking in Shanghai. The Japanese kill in all a little better than a quarter of a million people. Uh, and it is it is one of the great annals of history in terms of atrocities. Uh, they turn the Chinese female population into sex slaves for the for the uh, Japanese army, uh, and they uh, Im- force labor camps for uh, the Chinese men. Uh, and so it becomes a, a slave population to feed the, Ch- the Japanese army. Uh, and so Japanese atrocities are widespread. Preliminary moves from the United States. Now, this is something, it, one of the things that we try to clear up, okay? One of the things, you know, my, my wife was funny. She says, one of the reasons you like teaching U.S. history is you like debunking myths. Well, one of the myths that we debunk is that the United States... Uh, on the 7th of December 1941, the United States was minding its own business, happy as a clam, doing nothing, uh, and, the, and the, the sneaky Japanese, for no apparent reason whatsoever, uh, launched a, a vicious, uh, premeditated and unprovoked assault on Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's not entirely as true as you might think. Okay? First of all, we have the Stimson Doctrine in 32. This is after the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, in which the United States refuses to recognize any Japanese territorial acquisitions. Okay? They, it says deemed to be illegal there. They deem all of them to be illegal. The, the occupation of Manchuria, the United States, recognizes the nationalist government of China. Okay? And therefore, the, the, the Japanese occupation of Manchuria is illegal because the nationalist government isn't the one that invited them in. We then have the quarantine speech in 37, which is a commitment by the United States to stop the spread of the Japanese empire through Asia. We then have an arms embargo imposed on the Japanese. Uh, f- the, following this, we have a number of other moves, among them the freezing of Japanese assets. We'll also have the embargoing of oil. We'll have the embargoing of scrap metal. And so the United States really declares an economic war, okay, a, a boycott and embargo on Japan in the early 1930s, okay, so that by the time of 1939 and 1940, uh, the Japanese are being strangled by the United States economically. That's what you see there, the blockade of the Japanese petroleum scrap metal supplies. Uh, now, The reason that Roosevelt is doing this, this is a brilliant political move on Roosevelt's part. Roosevelt's New Deal, okay, is not having its desired effect. Like the first New Deal in 1935 came grinding to a halt, so too, by 1940, the second New Deal has come grinding to a halt. In addition to this, you have that American support. The American people have very little interest in the goings-on in Asia and Europe, okay? They're concerned more with trying to fix the American economy. So there's not an awful lot of support for Roosevelt's position to become involved in the war or to pursue pursue a more aggressive position towards the Japanese in Asia. Uh, so, So as a result of this, Roosevelt undertakes a series of actions that ultimately are intended to piss the Japanese off, okay? Freeze their assets, cut off their raw materials, cut off their scrap metals, try to hem them in. Uh, This places the the Japanese and the United States in an inevitable collision course, okay? Now, the mysterious thing to U.S. history, as we all know from our history books, is just from general knowledge, on 7 December 1941, uh, at a, about 6.30 in the morning local time, uh, the Japanese Navy launches a preemptive attack on Pearl Harbor uh, and knocks out, among other things, a large portion of the battleship force and a large portion of the American fleet. Okay, we all know that. That's from history. You know, read any high school history textbook, you'll see that. Okay. What's not really often approached, though, is an explanation for why it is that when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, there wasn't a single U.S. carrier at Pearl Harbor. Why not? 
Okay, they had all been redeployed in November, late November of 1941, because the United States began to expect an attack. Okay, and again, un, un, uh, unlike what many of us have heard uh, in in high school history textbooks, okay, the Japanese did in fact announce a declaration of war prior to the attack on the morning, not long prior, this was maybe 3 a.m. that the memorandum came in, uh, but the United States dragged its feet on decoding it, okay, and never got the message to Washington, D.C., and so it would be seen as a day that will live in infamy, okay, an unannounced, unprovoked attack. The Japanese, in fact, did announce that they were planning, that they declared war, okay, uh, of course, after this, Roosevelt will go make his famous speech, The Day That Will Live in Infamy. American support now rallies behind the war because in, in the view of the, of the Amer common American citizen, the Japanese, uh, there was no provocation for this attack. In, in the early phases of the Pacific Theater, of course, the United States, the United States expected this. The United States takes a few face punches. Uh, in April of 1942, they lose the Philippines. But in May, the next month uh, of 42, as a result of having redeployed the carrier fleet, okay, if the Japanese had managed, if the carrier fleet had, in fact, been at Pearl Harbor, uh, this may have been a very different outcome. You have the Battle of the Coral Sea, which is the first reversal for the Japanese Navy. Uh, it will prevent the Japanese invasion of New Guinea and Australia. Uh, and it's, so it's the first real reversal the Japanese have seen in their ongoing offensive in Asia, which begins really in 32. This is going to be the first reversal that they see. The U.S. strategy, which is designed actually by Douglas MacArthur, who will be in overall command of Allied forces in the Pacific, which is to say U U.S. forces in the Pacific, uh, is an island-hopping strategy, and it involves Houthier tactics. For those of us who are students of military history, Houthier tactics are actually kind of interesting. They, they have a certain danger to them, but the idea is to bypass uh, opposing strongholds, to move around them, and cut off their logistical supplies. Okay, so in this case, what, they, what, they, what the U.S. develops is an island-hopping strategy where you'll ultimately take individual islands going north in the Pacific until ultimately you take Okinawa as a staging area for an invasion of Japan proper. Okay? In doing so, you'll avoid the, the, the main islands, uh, the, the strongholds of the Japanese, okay? until you, the last minute. What you'll do is you'll take the other islands that are being used by the Japanese as support facilities. Okay, they have two types of islands. They have strongholds, where the military force is, and then they have support islands that are used to support those strongholds. Cut off the support islands, take those, and then the strongholds will simply kind of die on the vine. Iwo Jima was an, a classic example of this. Okay? We have a number of critical invasions, and I mentioned to you that we would make some use of, uh, and you see the web links there uh, uh, on the PowerPoint, you see the web links. This is uh, from HistoryAnimated.com, uh, and these are specific within HistoryAnimated.com. Unfortunately, when it comes to the European theater, the HistoryAnimated.com website is still building itself, and so it simply hasn't gotten around to building World War II in Europe. It does have an extensive discussion of World War II in Asia, and it's absolutely brilliant to watch. In fact, the the the, the war in Asia. Will, I'll, I'll talk. I'll mention when we get to the war in Europe. Uh, I'll mention Band of Brothers. Um, the war in Asia had had a, a similar a, a, a similar HBO uh, special uh, drawn to it, which name escapes me uh, right now. But my wife and I watched it, and while we watched it. The Pacific, I think it was called The Pacific. While we watched it, we sat there on HistoryAnimated.com uh, to go over the actual tactics and things like that. So it's actually very detailed and very good. Uh, and I heartily encourage you to go to these websites uh, to take a look at the Battle of Medi The Battle of Guadalcanal was the bloodiest of them all. You see it lasts for, what's that, August, September, October, November, December, January, from seven months. Uh, 
uh, and then Iwo Jima in, in 1945. And gradually the Japanese Empire uh, is pushed back, okay? In the European theater, the Allies uh, develop a three-pronged pincer attack on Germany. The idea is that first, the U.S. and British will, will launch a combined invasion of the Italian mainland. To do this, of course, they'll have to take Sicily first. Okay, This will cut off Rommel and the Africa Corps in Africa. The Soviet Union, in the meantime, will push the Germans back in the east. And then, at an opportune moment, the British and the United States and the remaining allies will open up another offensive uh, in Normandy, in France. Okay? Critical engagements. The first engagement by the United States, really, in the European theater of operations, it doesn't take place in Europe. It takes place in Africa. It's uh, the the landing. It's 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 actually just before Patton arrives on the scene. Uh, the Battle of the Kazarine Pass. And we mentioned in the in the first in the discussion of the first World War when the, when the Americans first arrive on the battlefront, they are really ill prepared to fight uh, a modern war like World War I. The same thing is going to be true in World War II. This will be demonstrated in the Kazarine Pass. The United States uh, gets crushed in the Battle of the Kazarine Pass. They get cut to ribbons, um, which actually allows Rommel and much of the Africa Corps to escape Africa. Uh, nonetheless, they will launch the invasion of Sicily, known as Operation Husky. You see a website there. Uh, that's on military history uh, that details the invasion of Sicily blow by blow for those of us who are interested in military history. Then you have the invasion of Italy proper in September of 43. The fall of Mussolini will be a gradual fall. The Italians at this point in history still have a king. This is 1943. Okay, the king will dismiss Mussolini in July of 43. Now, we want to remember that the United States and the Allies are now pressing in on Italy. The king would never have dared to dismiss Mussolini prior to this point. Okay, but he now has reasonable uh, hope, a reasonable chance that the Allies will support his position in the dismissal of, of Mussolini, which in, case, in fact they do. Mussolini will go into exile into northern Italy, where he'll be reestablished by the Germans. And from this point forward, it will be the Germans. The Italian army basically surrenders. Uh, Mussolini himself will be killed in April of 1945, uh, and he actually will be dragged through the streets. The people of, of Italy will drag him through the streets uh, and hang him. Okay. Then we have the very famous D-Day invasion. We're not going to talk too much about that. There have been movies made about it. There have been books written about it. You can get into that. You have, see a website here, ushistory.com, that goes over the Operation Overlord in great detail. I mentioned the Band of Brothers, and that other HBO special now that I recall is the Pacific. That's the one that deals with the Marines' experience in Asia against the Japanese. Band of Brothers, uh, I don't know if anybody has reviewed this on HBO, if anybody has HBO, if you've seen this on HBO, but it's an absolutely brilliant uh, discussion of the Normandy invasion. It follows Easy Company of the 82nd Airborne, who becomes, who is the one that's, that's desperately besieged in the Battle of the Bulge. They're the vanguard that gets cut off in the Battle of the Bulge and has to await reinforcements while surrounded by Germans who are constantly pressing in on them. Um, the Battle of the Bulge is the last major German offensive of the war. Uh, it's a last-ditch attempt to to at least to delay the invasion of Germany. Uh, now, in while all this is going on, by really by the end of 1942, it's very clear. This is after the Battle of Stalingrad and 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 the loss of so many German forces. It's very clear that the Allies are going to win the war. It's only a matter of time. The first conference that's going to take place is in Casablanca. Roosevelt and Churchill get together and agree that there will be no separate peace. Okay. In other words, no Allied power will will neither the United States or Great Britain particularly will seek a separate peace. There will be no peace with with Hitler with Germany. The the Nazi regime must be disposed. Okay. So too the military industrial complex in Japan must be deposed. 
It, there's no negotiated settlement here. Okay, it's a zero-sum game. Following this, you'll have the Tehran Conference. This is where they hash out Operation Overlord. Okay. Then we have the more famous ones. We have Yalta in February of 45. Okay. This is where the Allies essentially agree to divide up Europe. This actually won't officially be recognized by the United States until 1975 in the Helsinki Accords. Um by by the, the Nixon administration, uh, which we'll go over in the 1970s. But Roosevelt and Stalin will divide up Europe. West Germany will be divided in half. The western half will be uh, essentially U.S. allies. The east will become Soviet satellites. Uh, Austria will be officially recognized as a neutralized territory. Okay? And perhaps most importantly at Yalta, they will give the outlines for the development of the United Nations, okay, which will include the Soviet Union. The final of the conferences in, is in July of 1945. This is after the war. Okay, the Germans have been defeated. The idea is to expel the German ethnics from Eastern Europe to prevent a repeat of the Sudetenland. If you remember the Sudetenland, Hitler's position in the Sudetenland was, well, the western part of Czechoslovakia and part of the northern part of Czechoslovakia, they're all ethnically Germans and they're, and they're German speaking. So they're really Germans. So they should be part of German territory. The way to prevent that, get rid of all of the German ethnic population. Okay? S send them back to Germany. Uh, move the border of Poland 100 miles to the west, giving Soviet controlled Poland more territory. The United States will run the show in Japan, and in fact, they run the show to the point where they write the Japanese. MacArthur himself will actually take a hand in writing the Japanese Constitution. Interestingly, the Japanese emperor is not to be deposed. Okay? Um, and then finally, and the most contentious of all the points, is the division of the German capital itself in Berlin. Okay? And in fact, this will not be settled at Potsdam. They can't agree on this. Uh, the, I, because the problem, the, the, the Soviets say, well, wait a minute, we've gone along with this, this idea of the division of Europe and the division of Germany. Well, the problem is Berlin itself lies in the eastern part of Germany. It lies in East Germany, and therefore it should be East German, and therefore dominated by the Soviets. This, it should be a Soviet satellite. The West says, no, 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 no. No, the, Berlin is the German capital, uh, and so West Berlin will belong to the Allies, and so they go back and forth on this. And we'll have more on that in just, just a minute. The most significant of all of the conferences, however, at least for my money, is the Bretton Woods Conference, which takes place in the summer and fall in Bretton Woods, Vermont, uh, summer and fall of 1944. All of the other conferences deal with the political aftermath of the Second World War. This one is going to deal with the economic aftermath. And at Bretton Woods, the Soviet Union is excluded. Now, we want to lay some, some groundwork for this. As it is true that it was very clear by 1943 that the uh, Germans and the Axis was going to lose the Second World War, so too it was very clear, and it was actually clear long before the war even began, but by now it was very clear that following the war, a bipolar system was going to be established. This we can see in the political discussions that, that we just went over at, at Yalta and at Potsdam, particularly. We can see that this is the case. We're going to divide the world into a bipolar world. You're going to have the Soviet Union and the United States. These are going to be the two most powerful nations that come out of the Second World War. Uh, the United States, in an attempt... The United States, we already see this, this struggle that's going to be between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so in an attempt to limit the Soviet Union, the United States will, will uh, invite Britain and the other allied powers to, to Bretton Woods to discuss the establishment of a post-war economic order. The Soviets will be excluded, and therefore they'll be excluded from the post-war order. The reason for this, now, there's there's a number of things, and we'll just take a look at them. The first is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. This is what later will become known as the World Bank, which exists today. 
the World Bank that exists today was created at Bretton Woods. Okay, its specific purpose was to offer loans for developing nations. Principally what the United States had in mind was that it would be the principal financier of the reconstruction of Europe. Okay, which in fact it was. It did. It, it, was, it was largely uh, financed by the Marshall Plan in the United States, which we'll mention uh, in just a minute. Actually, I think we mentioned that in the next lecture. I'm not sure. Uh, but the Marshall Plan principally finances it through the World Bank. Okay, in later years, and one of the things we'll talk about much more in Epic Three, uh, it will be used to develop developing nations, such as in Southeast Asia and Africa, and it will continually be used, and many say even now is used as uh, how to say it, an economic carrot, an, an economic cat's paw for the United States to wield influence. Okay. Then you'll have the International Monetary Fund. Now, the International Monetary Fund has a specific purpose. Okay? How to explain it? Okay, explain it on an individual level. Any given year, any given month, you bring in a certain amount of dollars. You also spend a certain amount of dollars. Countries are the same way. Okay? Countries export. That brings money in. Countries import. That sends money out. Okay? If the money out exceeds the money in, you have a deficit. We've all experienced deficits, I'm sure. You have a deficit. The International Monetary Fund is specifically designed to lend money to pay off deficits. Okay? So if you run a trade deficit in a given month or a given year, you can go to the International Monetary Fund they'll lend you the money to pay off your trade deficit. Okay? Uh, now, since then, actually since the 1980s, the International Monetary Fund has taken on a very different function because, for reasons that we'll actually get into at a later time, I think, there is an invisible hand internationally such that in a floating exchange rate system, trade deficits balance out over time. Uh, and I'll explain that at a later at a later at a later time. One of the more significant developments at Bretton Woods is GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which exists today. This was formalized and institutionalized in the World Trade Organization in 1995. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade proceeds through a series of rounds of discussion. Okay, the first four of which are in Geneva, the first of them being in 47, the last of the Geneva rounds being in 54. Then you have the Kennedy round, the Tokyo round, the Uruguay round, which was in the 1980s. And beginning in the late 90s, you have the Doha rounds. The Doha rounds are ongoing. They're still taking place, Doha in, being in Qatar. Okay, they're, they're continuing to this day. The basic idea behind the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade is to cultivate free trade. One of the conclusions they draw from the Second World War, prior to the onset of war in Europe, okay, you see the development of protectionist trade policies, starting with the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act in 1932, but being followed by a slew. Okay, well, when and and what they came to the idea was protectionist trade policies isolate countries okay this fuels okay this facilitates the development of polarization and therefore the development of conflict ultimately the idea being that if you integrate everyone economically they will have less incentive to go to war with each other okay because everyone's economic well-being, okay, will be integrated with everyone else's, okay? And now this, this works out to be a decent enough idea, okay, certainly, but as we've seen since the Second World War, and we'll go over in Epic Three, it does have its negative ramifications, okay? Now the final thing, is an attempt to stabilize currency exchange. 
One of the more interesting studies in economics, and when I taught international trade and finance, we'd go over this at great length. In fact, one of the most difficult tests, actually, I think that I ever gave was uh, at the end of international trade and finance. Uh, they would have it was on currency exchange. They had uh, I, I I would print out nine pages of current. I would get it from the paper from the from from the New York Times usually uh, of currency exchange in the currency exchange market, uh, and then give them different scenarios and different deals that they'd have to make. Uh, currency exchange is one of the more interesting thing interesting studies. Well, really, even after the Second World War. The currency exchange itself was a very new phenomenon, okay, particularly because if you'll recall from our discussion of the Great Depression in 2.5, the gold standard is gone. They'd gotten rid of the gold standard. They're not going to bring the gold standard back, okay? And so everybody's kind of wondering, well, without the gold standard, what's going to be the underpinning? What's going to be the anchor of everybody's currency? So they develop what they call a pegged rate exchange system. Now, there are still pegged rate exchange systems that exist until only recently, the last couple of years, the Chinese pegged their currency to the dollar. Until 1997, the ASEAN nations, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, pegged their currency to the dollar. Okay? It's a very simple idea to understand. I peg, okay, pin the value of my currency to the value of another currency. It's very similar to what they did in the gold standard, but it's not exactly the same. Okay? What that means is that the value of my currency is going to fluctuate with the value of whatever currency it's tied to. All right? This is not the same as the gold standard. Now, the problem with this, they don't know. They don't see this at Bretton Woods. They establish this. What they do is they peg all currencies to one of two currencies. Okay? They peg them either to the British pound or to the U.S. dollar. And they set an equivalency, not an exchange value, just an equivalency, for the U.S. dollar to gold and the pound to gold. The U.S. dollar is $50 to an ounce and the British pound is 12 pounds to an ounce. Okay? But that's not the same as being able to exchange it. You're still not allowed to exchange it. Okay? And so now you see the purpose of Bretton Woods, to cultivate a stable international economic order it's what they refer to as the Liberal International Economic Order, the LIEO, uh, to reduce tension among members and to isolate Soviets and their satellites. The Soviets and all of Eastern Europe are not invited to Bretton Woods. They are not included in the agreement. Okay? This is the beginning. See, we're going to deal with this in Epic 3, at the beginning of Epic 3 at some length. The idea of the onset of the Cold War and the establishment of... Uh, the NATO organization and the cordon sanitaire around the Soviet Union, this is really the beginning of it. This is the idea to isolate the Soviet Union economically. Moving on to the wartime economy and how World War II was financed. It's very similar to World War I. Once again, as I mentioned then, uh, once again, the United States government will take control over the economy and the economy of the United States will be converted into a command economy. You'll have the War Manpower Commission, which will distribute and manage the labor force. You'll have the War Production Board, uh, which will be government control over production. There will be $17 billion for new factories, $18 billion in new government contracts. And this will be the final end of the Great Depression. Okay, This will get the United States economy pumping at full speed. This will push it, if you'll recall from the very introductory video and from the discussion in the Great Depression, this will push the United States not only all the way out to its PPC, production possibility curve, but will also extend the production possibility curve and expand the productive capability. Because by the time of, of the Japanese attack in 1941, and certainly before the German invasion of Poland in September of 39. The United States economy's uh, production levels were still below 1929 levels. They really hadn't recovered uh, from the Great De during the Great Depression. This will push those levels through the roof. Okay, you will also have established the Office of Price Administration. This this will control prices. This will ration ration the products for reasons that we won't get into now. We'll get into later. When you establish a price control, when you establish a price ceiling, it inevitably creates shortages. 
Okay, so rationing is going to be, in other words, uh, think of it this way, okay? During the war, the U.S. economy is going to shift production to war material. Tanks, planes, bombs, bullets, guns, okay? That's going to leave you short in terms of consumer goods. So the limited consumer goods that are going to be produced, they're going to be rationed, okay? Everything else is going to be committed to the war effort. They're also going to place controls on wages. Financing the war. In the single greatest move, probably in U.S. history, certainly in the Second World War, you know, people talk all about the, the tactics and the strategy of the Second World War and, you know, the Battle of Britain and all the various things. The greatest move in World War II was done by the United States in 1943. In 1943, the United States instituted automatic payroll deduction. Such a good idea was it that the British followed suit. This is taking money out of your paycheck to pay your taxes. Okay? And it always kills me. Okay? Every year. Every year. Okay? Just prior to April 15th, April 14th, I'm one of those, April 14th, as late as I possibly can, I write a check to the U.S. government for my taxes, okay? Last year, I paid nine grand, okay, as a result of my investment portfolios and whatnot. I had to pay nine grand to the U.S. government, okay? It always kills me, these people that look forward to their refund check. Oh, my goodness. Right there, oh, I'm going to get my tax refund. What is a tax refund? Think about this. What's a tax refund? What that means is that you've paid too much. You have given the United States government an interest-free loan for a year, which I always find unbelievable because, you know what? If I owe them money, they charge me interest, they charge me penalties, they owe me money. No interest accumulates. No penalties are uh, imposed. Nothing. Okay? I'm supposed to consider it gravy when I get it back at the end of the year and be very grateful for it. Okay? They begin this in the Second World War to maintain a steady flow of revenue. But it's such a great idea that the Truman administration after the Second World War will just continue it. Government spending goes through the roof, okay? Uh, in 1945, government, total government spending, total government outlays will be $98 billion. That's an 1,100% increase from 1939 spending levels, okay? That's what will jumpstart the economy. It does, however, just kind of to mention real briefly here, we'll, we'll get at it in the next epoch, it does, however, set you up for a problem, doesn't it? We kind of saw the problem after the Civil War. We saw the problem in spades after the world after World War One. Okay, and to explain it very quickly and very briefly. Okay, okay. So during the war, you've cranked up your production. Okay, because you've cranked up production, your labor force has been put back to work. What labor force isn't working in the industries is fighting on the battlefront. Okay, so the economy's moving at full tilt. After the war, production levels will drop because you don't need to meet the demand of the war. You don't need to be producing all these war materials. Okay? All of the men that were fighting at the front, well, they all come home now, and they're all going to need jobs. So you're facing a very dangerous situation. You're facing the potential... You're, you're facing the potential for the same type of artificial development you saw in the, 1950s, in the 1920s and ultimately a recession, okay, that in this case could be of epic proportions because you cranked up production so much that when it falls, it's going to be a much more dramatic effect. And we'll see how the Truman administration and Eisenhower administrations deal with this because this could be potentially a very dangerous situation for the United States. Uh, to, 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 to kind of just, uh, spoiler alert, give you just a little bit of foreshadowing, the Cold War has a lot to do with preventing it. 
in addition, part of that financing was research and development. Of course, the main thrust of research and development at this time was the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was uh, operationally under the control of J. Robert Oppenheimer, uh, and it was the development of the nuclear weapon. Okay, it was the idea of splitting the nucleus. This comes, it comes to some degree from Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, but really it comes from the idea of splitting the atom itself. Uh, the United States will begin testing in Los Alamos as early as 1943. Uh, in Trinity, New Mexico, 16 July 1945, you'll have the first successful test of a nuclear weapon, the atomic bomb. Okay. There are a number of reasons that are offered, okay, as rationale for dropping the atomic bomb on Japan. Let's look at them, okay, and see which of them makes the most sense. Reason number one, drop the atomic bomb to force them into surrender because the invasion of Japan, they estimate, would cost perhaps two million American lives. Well, okay. That makes sense, and certainly tactically that's probably true. The problem is this. By the time the United States had island hopped and moved all the way up to Japan, the Japanese Navy was in scrap metal. It was non-existent. They had no air force to speak of. Okay? Very easily, the United States could have blockaded Japan and simply starved them into submission. Japan is an island. They can't produce enough food for themselves, let alone enough raw materials. Their industrial base was in ruins. They had be, been reduced to the Stone Age. Why would you need to invade them? If you just launch a siege, and a siege for two or three years, without firing a single shot, the Japanese would be forced into, 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 into submission because of starvation. Okay, so that excuse is out the window. Second, also a plausible excuse, vengeance for Pearl Harbor, right? Get the Japanese back for their vicious, uh, unprovoked attack, although, as we saw in previous slides, it wasn't as unprovoked as uh, we originally had thought. Um, but get them back for that. Okay, that makes sense. Nuke them. That, pff, nothing... <laughs> Nothing nothing gives you a vendetta like nuking someone, right? Okay, so we nuke them. Well, there's a problem with this thinking, too. A nuclear weapon isn't the best, the, the most effective way of wreaking vengeance on someone. You know what's better? A firebombing. Now, what a firebombing does is you drop so many high-explosive munitions on top of each other that it creates a chain reaction. Okay, so that the fire feeds off its own oxygen. This is what's known as a firestorm. Okay, they firebombed Tokyo on 9 March 1945. It killed 150,000 Japanese civilians. This was not the only city that the United States had done this to. The United States did this systematically up the coast of Japan. Okay, killing in all probably about half a million civilians, deliberately targeting civilian populations. These were not military targets, okay, to soften Japan up. You've certainly seen all of the, all of the vengeance you need. This was, uh, I make reference to the earlier firebombing of Dresden. Dresden was firebombed uh, a little bit earlier than that. Uh, and it killed approximately 50,000 German civilians. Dresden in Germany was a civilian town. There was no military application to the town whatsoever. Okay, so there's your vendetta. Now you've sought your vengeance. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense in the cold light. Now, here's what makes a lot of sense. As mentioned earlier, we are at a critical stage in negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union. Yeah, Britain's there too, okay? And I th so is France for that matter. But it's really a critical stage of negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union over principally the division of Germany, but most specifically the division of Berlin itself. And Stalin is being a jerk about it, okay? He's like, you know what? The entire Soviet army, they had at the time 18 divisions in Germany. 
okay? You want East Berlin, you, you want West Berlin, you want to divide Berlin in half, you go ahead and try. Go ahead. I dare you. Okay, we're not moving. We're done with this. Okay, we begrudgingly give you this. We have the entire Soviet army. If we want to, we could sweep across Western Europe. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Okay, and so there was some saber rattling, and it was very tense negotiations. And in the midst of the tense negotiations, now, of course, Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had passed away at this point, and Truman was now president. In the midst of these negotiations, Truman says, you know what, Joe? I've had enough of this. Let me explain something to you. We have just recently, and we saw when the, when the bomb was tested, okay, in, 19, in 1945, okay, we have just recently developed a weapon that can wipe a city off the face of the planet. If you keep stonewalling in these negotiations and don't behave reasonably, we may have to demonstrate that to you and use it on the Soviet Union. Okay, you're talking about having all these divisions, all this army here that you're going to do it. We can wipe them off the planet with this weapon. And it's questionable as to whether or not Stalin didn't understand what he was saying or didn't fall for the bluff or didn't believe him. Uh, and so in an effort to demonstrate the destructive capacity of this new super weapon, Truman just simply chose a couple of Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, one of the myths is that, well, no, he planned Hiroshima, and then when the Japanese didn't surrender as a result of that, then they planned Nagasaki. Look at the dates. Actually, my, uh, Hiroshima, the bomb at Hiroshima, uh, was dropped on my birthday. Not my original, I mean, I was born 19 years later. I was born in 64. I was born 19 years to the day after the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. I've always taken that as kind of significant. Um, but if you look at the timing, Nagasaki, they launched it on 8 August. To launch such an operation takes weeks of planning. You're talking about the logistical support. Okay, the delivery of the weapon itself, the logistical support for the delivery of the weapon, the logistical support for the airstrike going in with the weapon. It takes weeks to develop such a plan. They planned both bombs at the same time. Okay, in rapid succession. They hit Hiroshima on 6 August. They hit Nagasaki on 8 August because weather on the 7th of August prevented a clear targeting of Nagasaki. Okay, so they planned both weapons. Now, the reason they planned both weapons is because those two atomic weapons were the sum total of all the fissile, the weapons level fissile material the United States had developed. Okay, that was it. It would take another six months or more for the United States to develop additional fissile material to make more bombs. Okay, so they were both dropped. The Japanese, of course, surrender after the falling of the bomb on Nagasaki, and Stalin gives in on the point of Berlin. Now, he'll begrudgingly give in on the point in Berlin, and one of the things we'll see in epic number three is the first showdown between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1948 uh, is the Berlin blockade. The Soviets will say, well, okay, well, we'll deal with that later, but they, they blockade West Berlin. Finally, and in conclusion, after the war, the U.S. and the Soviets emerge as the two greatest powers. This establishes the bipolar situation that I mentioned earlier. It came as no surprise to anyone that it was going to be like this. The other thing is what I mentioned in the previous slide, a couple of slides ago. The problem for the U.S. is how to prevent the economic aftermath of the First World War. Remember, we're now going to have to draw down production we're going to have all this excess manpower from the people who were fighting. How, are, how is the United States going to prevent the economy from falling once again into a recession? That concludes PowerPoint Lecture 2.6. It also concludes Epoch 2.